Hello, welcome to chapter 16. I'm Sean Kelly, and this is my channel on everything real estate. Much of this is a continuation from the previous chapter where we'll dig into property management. I need you out of here in the morning. The hell am I supposed to be out of here by tomorrow? One week, and you paint it. Down in the description below, I have a 10% off link for new signups for real estate courses in North Carolina. And I have to say this every time, but I'd really appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button and gave this video a thumbs up. Thanks. All right, let's go. I'm going to kick this off with a high probability test question. The definition for property manager is someone that maintains the value on a house and generates the highest possible return. They don't just manage the property. They maintain the value on the house. Therefore, they should be doing some proactive maintenance on that property too, which we'll get into a little bit more later. A property manager can either be a person or a firm and they manage the property for another. Typically, the people that are employed by a property manager company are licensees. It just makes things so much easier. However, unlicensed salary employees that work for property management companies can show properties, they can collect money, and they can fill out forms, and they can provide information. But they can't negotiate terms or money. Remember, as we discussed before, property managers are general agents. They have a little bit of power there. And remember, realtors are special agents. We really don't have any power. A property manager can get paid in different ways. The first being a percentage, which is usually about 10%. You don't need to remember the 10% part, but there's a percentage. Then you have a flat fee rate, which is negotiated. Then you have a per unit fee, and then some combination of the above. You can have all of those kind of mixed, whatever you negotiate. An agreement the homeowner and the property manager must have is the property management agreement, which must be in writing. It must state the start and end date. It must state any of the fees that are required. You must also discuss the termination or vacancy duties, like what happens when the tenant moves out. And then you must also state the responsibilities for both the homeowner and the manager. Are they going to replace air filters? What are they going to do? And that must be stated on this agreement. A property manager needs to understand what the homeowner or the investor considers profit. This may seem easy, but an investor may want to save some money for a rainy day fund or capital expenditures or vacancy loss or something else. So they may not consider the entire rent income as profit. The manager should then have a business plan to assist in growing that profit. Typically, a property manager has several duties, but all of these can be negotiated. So in general, they can create a budget, they can save for big repairs or capital expenditures, they can calculate the cash flow, make reports, market the property, advertise the property, screen tenants, and maintain the value of the property which goes back to the definition of what a property manager, manager is. And there's so many more things that a property manager can do, but those are the main ones. Use your imagination here. You can pay someone to literally do almost anything you'd want. So the fact that the book states that property managers can do this and can't do that really is kind of misleading because they technically could do a lot of those things if you paid a little bit extra, if they had an attorney in their firm, things like that. Every company is gonna be different. Some of the ones that you don't pay much for won't really do anything with that property. And some that are really expensive will change out the air filter every single month. So it just depends. So we spoke about this in previous chapters and earlier in this chapter, but again, what can unlicensed assistants do? They can show properties, get the rent, receive the rent payment, and fill out forms. But they can't negotiate any terms or price, receive a commission, or give advice. This is for unlicensed assistance for rental companies, property management companies, not real estate agents. And in case you skip through some of my previous chapters, we'll brush through this next concept as well. To analyze cash flow, use the acronym PIN-C. Now it doesn't really mean anything, but it worked for me. P is potential income. P is at the very top level here. And what you wanna do is you wanna subtract your vacancy, which is like when a tenant moves out and you don't have any rent coming in for a month or so. Subtract your vacancy and any collection loss, meaning that the tenant just can't pay you, they don't pay you, and you just miss out on that month's rent. That there will give you your E, which is effective income. 
For effective income, you then take out your property management expenses or your operating expenses, and that'll give you your net income. Then with that net operating income, you subtract out your mortgage payments and your PITI, so your principal, interest, taxes, and insurance, and that will give you your cash flow. Maintaining a property comes in various forms. There is preventative, which does exactly what it sounds like. It fixes or it addresses a future problem, a problem before that problem happens, before something is actually broke. Corrective maintenance, which is fixing something after it is already broken. And then routine maintenance, so things like changing out your air filters once a month or spraying for termites and infestations. When it comes to qualifying tenants, the same rules apply as when you're finding homeowners. You must comply with discrimination laws, Equal Credit Opportunity Act, the Fair Housing Laws, Disability Laws, and the ADA, and we'll cover most of these laws in future chapters and some we've already covered. When qualifying tenants, all provable sources of income must be counted, so things like social security, child support, and you must also accept Section 8. When it comes to commercial or public facilities, accommodations must be made for those with disabilities. All facilities must have in place handicapped parking, accessible restrooms, and wheelchair ramps. Anything that was previously built before this law became into place in 1990 must be fixed or updated if it's readily achievable. Readily achievable. If a building that isn't in compliance is being sold, the buyer can demand that the seller fix it, but the seller, of course, does not have to. As mentioned in a previous chapter, security deposits must go into a trust account. Any money that is given to a provisional broker must immediately go to your broker in charge. Brokers can physically handle money that is for due diligence and earnest money, but any money that comes from anything else like inspections and repairs and all those other things cannot be handled by the actual broker. When a security deposit is placed into a trust account, that money is just sitting there and potentially collecting some interest on it throughout that entire year term or whatever term is negotiated. The person that gets that interest on that security deposit is negotiable and is set in the terms that are signed when the lease is set or in the terms with the property manager and the investor. So if you're an investor, you probably want to negotiate with your property manager that you want to keep that interest that is made on the security deposit. If it's a $1,500 security deposit though, it's really only going to be two or three bucks at the end of the year because interest rates are super low. The last thing to note on trust money, and I've said it in previous chapters, is that you can't go and spend this money on just anything. You also can't mix this security deposit money with your incoming rental money. It must be in its separate account. Well, I feel like I managed that whole thing pretty well. Okay, let's start from the beginning and go through this quickly. A property manager's main role is to maintain the value of the property and generate the highest possible return. That's a key definition you'll need for the test. A property manager also owes the homeowner or the investor the fiduciary duties, not the tenant. In the same way that a broker or an agent has fiduciary duties to their client, but not the customer. The property management agreement must be in writing, have a start and end date, state the fees, state the duties of both the uh, property manager and the broker, and the termination duties. The duties of a property manager are to maintain a budget, plan capital expenditures, calculate the cash flow, make reports, and market the property, screen tenants, and maintain the home. An unlicensed rental assistant can show properties, they can receive the rent income, and they can fill out forms, but they can't negotiate terms and price, they can't give advice, and they can't receive any commission. When qualifying tenants, you must follow the discrimination and fair housing laws that we'll cover in this next chapter. Criminal background checks when qualifying tenants must be either done for everyone you're qualifying or no one. You can't pick and choose who you want to give a criminal background check to. A tenant's source of income could be pretty much from anything as long as they could prove it and as long as it's legal. All public and commercial facilities must have accessible bathrooms, a parking space, and ramps for access. Trust money must be placed into a trust account immediately, but no later than three days. And you can't just spend this security deposit on anything, and you can't mix it with your rental income. And that's it. We are at the end of this video. Chapter 17 is next on fair housing. Hit the subscribe button down below so you'll see me on the next video. And I'll see you on the next chapter of the North Carolina real estate exam prep. Thanks again.